All right, we are recording. Welcome back to another Serious Angler podcast, episode number 130. Uh, We're chugging along. Actually, you know what? I'm just realizing right now I made a mistake. It is 31 because 30 is Monday. Yeah, so this will be uh, aired next uh, Wednesday, which so today's Wednesday. How's everybody doing today, Andy? What's going on, my man? Hanging out, you know, drinking some beers, having a good time. Long day at work. Uh, not some looking forward news. to the weekend. Some <laughs> bad <laughs> news on a <laughs> derby. <laughs> uh, Would you like hopefully to share? Our, hopefully our uh, guests can teach me some muddy water smallmouth tricks. So <laughs> like this. <laughs> We, uh, we have our derby on Lake Ontario, Lower Niagara this Saturday, and we had gale force winds last night and the day before, and we're down to about three inches of visibility, and our tournament directors have decided to keep the tournament as is at the moment. So yeah. it should be interesting. <laughs> yeah, smallmouth and muddy water usually are a great mix. <laughs> no. But our guest today will uh, definitely be an testament to that. He'll talk all about it. And if there's anybody that could do it, it's going to be him. So today we're going to have on Mr. Scott Dobson uh, from Michigan. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of different stuff with Scott today. But before we do, Andy, we got some people to thank. Uh, Douglas first, Rods. Douglas Rods. Uh, thank you guys for your constant support. Um, we are looking forward to, what is it, in two, no, three, three weekends? From three now? weekends. Yeah. Douglas Here. Derby and Buffalo. Yeah, the Lake Erie, uh, Safe Harbor. That should be a blast. Fingers crossed that it's not Gale Force winds like this past week. Never know with <laughs> never know with Erie in October and November. So, yeah, yeah. We're, we're hoping for the best. But shout out to Douglas. Thank you guys for your constant support. Uh, shout out to Amped Outdoors, Morgan Marine, Hobie, and Queen. Thank you all for your constant support. We have some stuff we'll talk about at the end of this podcast. Um, but we're gonna talk to Scott first. And uh, it's going to be a blast. So without further ado, we're going to get him on, Mr. Scott Dobson. What's going on, sir? How you doing, guys? Thanks for yeah, having me. Absolutely. Appreciate you Welcome. taking time out to join us tonight. Hey, I love talking fishing, uh, especially with people that know how to talk about fishing. So, <laughs> Without a doubt. I um, hope that we can live up to your standards. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you can. So I heard you guys talking about muddy water smallmouth, uh, and we can talk about that later for sure. But... This year, you're talking about the wind, and and I renamed the whole summer the Windy Series because every tournament we had this year has been just blowing out wind, especially the all the Sandusky tournaments that we had this year for the uh, two FLW Series and the Pro Circuit event. And then we had another Toyota Series up around the Detroit River and a BFL last weekend, and the wind just blew relentlessly. All the time. Uh, it was crazy. It was just, I hated waves always. And when you get older, you start to hate, hate waves and big runs. Well, this year was crazy. We ran some big waves and we put our boats to the test and it was just a, it was a crazy year, but COVID aside, but just the waves and the big water in the, in the Great Lakes, it's just, uh, ugh, I hate the big water. <laughs> we got to tell somebody to turn the turbines off. Exactly. And I don't think that's going to happen because it's it's blowing. It was blowing today. I was at my son's football game and I had to go inside the press box. It was so windy. So oh, and it's going to blow tomorrow. But we got light and variable on Saturday and it's fall. And when fall, cold weather, shorter days, we think big, big, big smallmouth. Absolutely. So, <laughs> but hey, happy to be here. I don't know what you guys want to talk about. Let me know, and uh, we'll get into it. Absolutely. We just brought you on here to talk and drink beer. That's all. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, <get back. laughs> I don't mind doing that. I might have to bring the uh, the Yeti cooler over. But, uh, there you go. But uh, uh, first and foremost, I think what's kind of cool, because for up here, we don't have uh, sports playing right now. But you mentioned how your son had a football game. So I'm curious. Did, uh, how's that? What's that scene? I'm just because I'm a sport fanatic. So I'm just curious. What's that scene like? And also, did he win? <laughs> Most important. No, they got they got blown away. Um, oh, geez. So he's uh, he's a freshman, and they started practicing uh, late summer, like in August. Okay. And then our famous Governor Whitmer, which everyone knows in the United States, but our, our Michigan governor, she actually shut down motor boating 
earlier in the year when COVID came out, which was a big crisis. But you can have high school football. But, well, so they then they started practicing, then they stopped practicing, no sports. And then finally, the Michigan High School Athletic Association, they worked something out with the governor, and they started practicing again about eh, three weeks, three and a half weeks ago. So they had about five days of practice, and they had the first game. So they're three games deep. Uh, only two people can go to the game. So, you know, the, the mother, father typically, or you could give your tickets away to someone else if you weren't going. And you have to mask up when you go into the bleachers. But then if you're eating popcorn, obviously you can take your mask off, which kind of defeats the purpose. I don't <laughs> so let me guess, so, you just eat popcorn the whole time. It's funny because I bought this big bag of popcorn and my buddy's like, what are you going to do? Eat the popcorn the whole game? I said, yep. <laughs> so I eat like one kernel at a time. And I sat there the whole time, never wore a mask. So Perfect. They, they, uh, they, they hit you with a little temperature gun when you walk in. So uh, they hit me with the temperature gun. I was good. Went to the game. It was a good game. They did uh, they did lose, but they you know they didn't have a lot of time to practice. It almost looked like the other team, like they practiced for like twelve weeks, like they were pretty dialed in. So, <laughs> but it was good. I, I that was my first game that I got to go to. I missed uh, this game last week because I was pre fishing for the BFL, which is on the Lower Detroit River out of Trenton. And then the week before that, um, I was down on the Detroit River. Detroit River for the Toyota Series, which I, I won, which mm -hmm. was awesome. It, sometimes you win these tournaments when you least expect it. When you think you're going to win, you end up second. So that <laughs> one, I just somehow I pulled it off, but it was a miserable three days of fishing. But it worked out, and I got the W, and it felt great. Uh, anytime in and, and Trenton, Trenton, Michigan, where that tournament went out of, was is my original hometown. That's where I was born and raised. And that's where I got into fishing, um, which I guess is something that I think you guys mentioned you might want to talk about. Yeah, yeah we should just ask the question now and get right into it. Yeah, that right. would, first and foremost that we like to ask is, you know, what's that first bass catch like? How'd you get into it? Who got you into the whole uh, sport of bass fishing? We want to hear the whole story. Well, like anyone else, I mean, I grew up watching Bass Masters and the Bass Master magazine. And Bill Dance, Jimmy Houston, and Roland Martin, of course. I mean, the great American fisherman, right? So yeah. I, I grew up watching fishing shows, and my aunt and uncle had a uh, – where they lived up in a little bit further north in Michigan, about an hour and a half from where I grew up. They had a huge uh, sand. They bought this lot. It was like 80 acres, and it was a huge sand, sand pit. And they mined all the sand out of that area for to build a highway and ultimately a big lake developed and he put structure in there and he planted bass and he was an outdoorsman my uncle and uh, I would go up there in the summertime and I would I would stay with my aunt and uncle and my first bass catch I was probably five or six years old and I remember it to this day because the picture actually went in the newspaper for the Pier Times or whatever the, the newspaper was up there in that town at a black Levi denim jacket on. And I was out on the backside of the pond and it was a Zepco 202. I couldn't even cast the thing. So Beautiful. My, older, my older brother had to cast the worm out there and it was a K and E bass stopper, pre-rigged purple worm with the white stripe. You know, the one that comes out of the package and it's got the big hook in it and it spins when you reel it in. Oh yeah. So he whipped it out there and I just started reeling it in. And that thing was, helicoptering through the water. I, I thought it was like a 10 pound bass, but it was probably like three and a half pounds. That was, <laughs> that was my first memorable fish that I ever remember catching. And I was like hooked ever since then. So I'd run around their pond and I, I could see a lot of the bass, the water was clear and obviously they would never bite, right? You throw out all these fish, they just swim away. Uh, so I spent a lot of time there and then growing up, which in Michigan, we call it down river, uh, in Trenton is where the Detroit River feeds into Lake Erie. And my my folks, my mom and dad, they had a, I, I wouldn't call it a yacht, but when I was a kid, it was a yacht. It was a 35-foot Chris Craft, and that was a pleasure boat, and they'd take people out, entertain clients and whatnot. But we would go off the break wall, and we would, we would fish off, off, off the dock and catch walleye, catch silver bass, catch smallmouth, and then – 
you know, spring and spawn, we would catch a lot of largemouth. We'd run around, hit all the little, the backwaters, the canals and all that. So we'd throw buzz baits and purple worms and we had our Berkeley lightning rods and we were all into that. And we used to ride our bikes, our 10 speeds, and we'd strap our fishing poles onto the frame and that rod would be sticking out like, you know, three or four feet, like a javelin. We'd be riding around and we 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 had to get distance, right? We had to get to other fishing locales because we didn't have a boat. So you can't really fish off a 35 foot boat. Like, hey dad, wheel me up there to that grass up there so I can catch him. He wanted to go and drink beer. So <laughs> we spent hours and hours and hours fishing ponds in canals of the Great Lakes. We had some actual ponds we fished, but most of it was on the Detroit River canals that fed into the Detroit River, bays that attached to it, anything we could get to by feet. We did some wading, um, but it was mostly riding bikes, getting to places. And then when it turned 15, man, you could get a spree, a moped. Hmm. And we were really mobile. So game we could, changer. Game changer. <laughs> then you had, to get a, you had to get a backpack, and then you had to strap your rod kind of like into your backpack. And then you could really – go places so um the white bass or we call them silver bass i'm sure you, i don't know what you guys come up there in, in lake erie and buffalo but that was something that we looked forward to every year when the white bass would run in june we would go out and we would catch hundreds of them and we would keep them and we would use them for you know bartering tools we would basically i wouldn't say sell them but we would do exchanges for things so <laughs> So we would catch these white bass, we'd fill up coolers with them or five gallon buckets and we'd take them to places and we would, that's how we got our, our beer. That's <laughs> perfect. Because awesome. we couldn't buy it. So we'd say, hey, you want some white bass? You got to go buy us some beer. So, uh, so that was that was what we, I did all, all through high school. And then when I went away to college, obviously, you know, I never thought I'd get into to tournament fishing i loved watching i'm like well that's never going to be me i'd love for it to be me but i didn't have the money and i went away to michigan state and uh my i guess it would be my sophomore year um i met who became my best friend kevin long and he used to fish the tour back in the day now he's a guide out of uh, roland martin's marina down in lake okeechobee and he guides down there in the winter, then in the summer, he's a smallmouth guide on St. Clair and a musky guide. He stopped fishing tournaments, but we're still best friends. And he and I met at Michigan State, and he had a phone. He had a sea nymph, 16 and a half foot sea nymph with a 40 horse tiller. And he built it out. He customized, he made a, a casting deck, a tackle storage departments, and we would take back bottles in Michigan. We get 10 cents. A can or bottle and that's how we got our gas money after fraternity parties and parties and michigan state we'd run back to the myers up here which is a grocery store and we'd return them into the machines and we'd get our money and that's how we got gas money and we started fishing some local tournaments around uh, east lansing and you know the small time stuff and then uh, we got into the the red man stuff which is probably yeah. BFL. Which is now the BFLs, right? Yeah. Yeah, Redman, which is you know now the BFL. So that was tailing into like 1994. Um, we got into like the Michigan Bass Federation, which was pretty big time, man. That was like huge. Like these guys were like had these big bass boats, and they still were wearing those polyester suits. I mean, that was still in back then, which was bizarre, but. <laughs> so we started fishing that and you know obviously we had all the trials and tribulations of not doing well having an aluminum boat and uh, we pretty much sucked it up and then uh graduated in 95 and kevin like he was all in to tournament fishing he was going to do it for a living and so his dad helped him out he got a champion like a 1991 champion so it was probably five or six years old and it had like a 150 and uh we started fishing a lot of team tournaments together we both chipped in for the gas and we used to sleep in the back of the truck and the tents i mean the whole gamut that you hear everyone talk about we did that and uh i remember i think my first big check was in i got it right here 
<laughs> this is awesome. No <laughs> more. In one of these hundreds of trophies, I got the name of here. <laughs> one of these 84 local trophies that he has. <laughs> yeah. so my first big, big, big check was, I think it was 1998. That something that I thought was monumental was second place in a red man. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. Then, and yeah. I, I think in 95, I, I, I cashed a decent check in a, in a tournament in 95, and I had big bass, and I was – Tickled. I remember my parents came to the weigh-in and everything. I was like, oh, my God, I felt like I won like a million dollars. Like, you won like $1,300, which is – it's still a lot. You know, my, actually, in 95, that was a lot of money in 95. Yeah. And, like, those Red Man tournaments back in the day, like, they would have, like, 100, 100 boats would be, like – that's, like, 200 boaters, right? Because it was yeah. boater on boater. Well, I didn't have a boat, so I went with whoever I had. And, anyway, I'm this little pimple face kid out of college trying to ask my guy to hey take me over here because i really caught some fish over here because we would go and practice for these red mans for like four five six days it was insane you would never do that now you you know you spent a day or two for a bfl you're, you're exhausted <laughs> we were exhausted you know we're sleeping in tents and freezing cold and eating oatmeal so that's basically how it started tournament fishing for me started in college in uh, like around 92, 93, we fished out of that aluminum boat. And oh, for spring break one year, I think it was our junior year, like all the guys went to like Key West and down to Florida. And Kevin and I, we hooked up that CNM with that 40 horse tiller. And we towed it all the way down from Detroit, essentially, to Lake Okeechobee. And we spent our whole spring break on Okeechobee in Clewiston, and we camped at the the KOA campground there outside of Clewiston, and uh, we fished every day on Okeechobee. That's back when Okeechobee was all eelgrass, and it was like a spinnerbait bite and a bang oh, bangalore. And we were catching like 30, 40 fish a day. Like, that was like, oh, my God. I can't what a riot. That. It was fun, yeah. So then, uh, you know, we progressed, and, and then, you know, post-college, uh, we we got into the BFLs and then I was fortunate where I, I landed a pretty good gig and I got to travel over the United States and I was making bank. And I was working for a, a contractor doing work for Taco Bells and uh, I saved up a lot of money and I did that for like eight months and I came home and I, I bought a Triton in 1998, 99. It was one of the first Tritons ever built and I bought it off of Guy Acre. And I drove down to his place down there in, uh, in South Carolina and Hickory, wherever he lives. And he was the nicest guy in the world. And uh, he sat me down, told me all about bass fishing and this and that and how wonderful the boat was. And it was a great boat. It was one of the first six built. And, uh, and it was Triton boats, boats built to last a lifetime. So I thought that meant I could just take it out and smash it through all the big Blake St. Clair waves and nothing would happen to it. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, oops. It didn't really work out that way. So uh I learned quick that uh yeah, big waves and 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 bass boats, uh you you gotta respect the uh you gotta respect the water and you gotta prepare the boat. So but that was it. So um that was that in ninety-nine I started fishing and I had all the all the ups and downs and I really got into smallmouth fishing because I lived right here close to Lake St. Clair. So that's where I would go. I would fish every single day. I worked for four or five, six hours during the day. And then I would run over to the lake and I'd spend four or five, six hours on the lake. And I did that every chance I could when I could get out there when the water was thawed out. And I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears on, on Lake St. Clair, the Detroit River, the St. Clair River, the western portion of Lake Erie. And we went through all the trends of the dragon, you know, with the drift socks and never, you would never hold on a spot back then. It was all drifting and dragging. I mean, you, you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. And now you see someone dragging, you're like, what's that buffoon doing? You know, like he's got a drift sock out. You're supposed to hold with, you know, on anchor mode on your Lawrence ghost. But uh, my first big, big win or big accomplishment, I think was in um, Everstart, in like 2000 on 
uh, St. Lawrence River out of Clayton, New York. I led the tournament going into day three. That's when the ever starts were four day events and uh, led it into day three and the wind blew out of the east like 20 miles an hour and blew all the water, the warm water out of the bay I was fishing and the water dropped 10 degrees overnight. And I went out there and I came in with two fish and I was humbled beyond belief. And that's when I realized that you got to have more options and you got to refine your skills and spend more time, not just getting laser locked on, oh my God, this is the only thing I'm fishing. I'm going to win it here. And I, I was just humbled that I got, I, I, I got, crushed and i looked at the guys that beat me and they all had a lot more experience than me and i'm like well, one day i'll win one and i don't think i won a toyota series till 2016 oh, you know like a big tournament so like oh, i think my in my first bfl win uh, which was a huge accomplishment i think came in probably 2007 maybe um so and then as far as uh, getting into the tour, the FLW tour, I started back in uh, 2002, I got into an FLW Open. That's when the last term of the year, it was called an Open and they would let people in off the waiting list if people dropped out. And it was on Lake St. Clair and we had unlimited practice. So I practiced for like seven days and uh, <laughs> I came in seventh place in that tournament and that's when uh, espn filmed it and uh they had tommy sanders and twenty seven thousand dollars for seventh place was huge that is uh, massive and so i took that check and i went to the bank and i paid off all my student loans that's from, amazing. from michigan state so that was you know i graduated in 95 so i guess seven years later because that book those student loan books are like that thick. They're like, it was huge. I'm oh. like, I'm, I'll never get through this, this student loan. And when I, I won that money, I took it down. I, I paid off my student loans and uh, I fished this Everstart and I did like third or fourth in the points. And then I went and fished the tour the next year. I think that was 2003. And the first term on Lake Okeechobee met me at the top 10. I'm like, this is easy. Two top 10s in my first two FLW tour events. I'm like, these guys suck. <laughs> <laughs> Every tournament after that, I, I pretty much it was it was a big it was a big learning experience because I had no business fishing some of these lakes that we went to. I was like lost. I mean like dumbfounded lost. And I did relatively well a year. I think I missed the uh, championship by like one or two points. And, mm. and and mind you, during that, I was still, I was working full time. I was starting a, a business up here in Michigan and uh, it gave me the ability to travel. But you, I learned right away, like these guys are going to eat you to death. You got to, you got to put in your time. You got to, you got to pre-practice. You got to do a lot of lake studying. And you got to come out here and you got to be out in that water from sun up to sundown. And I was still working. So I would have to work a couple hours in the morning. I'd have to get off the lake a little bit early and I'd still have to work in my computer. So it took me a lot of years to develop my largemouth game down south because um, the guys are great. Now, up here in, in, in the northern country, I didn't have an issue, but I just never could win at the national level. And I still have a burning desire to win at the national level and I've been so damn close so many times and I just cannot close the dang door until this year on Sandusky. Now I should have won that tournament, but we, we, we let in those 54 MLF guys, and, <laughs> which is fine. And I didn't have any problem with that because it went from 150 boat field in the uh, Takawaros pro circuit. You know, we got shut down in, um, in March after we had uh rayburn it was our first tournament of the year and i top tend in there i came in six then we went to harris chain i cashed a, a, a decent check there then we went to uh, lake martin and lake martin almost got shut down from COVID. like we didn't know if we were going to fish or not they did all the social distancing and the mass and this and that and it was it was a train wreck i cashed a check there and then we got shut down from march all the way through to late june when we went to chickamauga 
Mm -hmm. So our whole schedule got tweaked. Like my, my year last year was set up to be incredible. Like I was going to have an opportunity to uh, sight fish on Cherokee, uh, to sight fish on Hartwell. And I love to sight fish smallmouth or largemouth or spots. And then we were going to go to, um, there's one on, oh, you, uh, we were going to go to Dardanelle. I wasn't crazy, crazy about Dardanelle, but we were supposed to finish off. At the St. Lawrence, the, right? No, we were supposed to finish off here in, in Detroit, oh. Oh, on man. the Detroit River, end of June, which is like, I got more wins in the end of June on Lake St. Clair than Carter has lumber. Like, that's my time <laughs> of the year. It's, it's, it's post-spawn. And I was like, oh, my God. And the last time we were here in, in June, and back in 2018, I uh, I came in fourth in that tournament. Was that the one Chad Grisby won with the spy bait? Yeah. So, yeah, Chad won it in 2018 out in the middle of Lake St. Clair on the Canadian side in like 17, 18 feet of water. And Brad Knight and Dylan Hayes came in. It was Grisby, Brad Knight, Dylan Hayes. They were second. I don't know what place dylan and brad knight were but all four of those three of those guys were within a quarter mile and those fish had no business being there they shouldn't have never been there that time of the year so either those fish didn't it really warm that year too in june so that could have caused them to get out there i feel like 2018 was a really warm spring those fish were so fat they were so fat and so healthy hmm. they either they're they, almost like pre-spawners either they they went up to spawn and they said, eh, something ain't right. And they pulled back. But those fish on the South shore of Lake St. Clair, they don't, they don't spawn until June. Um, they shouldn't have been that fat and, and good for Chad. I mean, he, he won it handedly. And, and, you know, I'm like, the tournament's going to take 80, 80, 81, 82 pounds to win. I think I had 84 or 80. So I don't remember what I had, but they all, they all won. They did great. And uh, that just goes to show you that, the guys, when you get out there and even being a local, yeah, you have an advantage, but if you don't practice everything out there to sample everything that's available, you can yeah. get beat. And that's why, you know, guys win tournaments and guys come in second, third, and fourth, because you get laser focused on, on how it takes to win. And typically in, in, in the end of June, post spawn fish like to be around some current, not necessarily mm -hmm. in the river, but they want current coming across them. On Lake St. Clair and in the in the Detroit River. So, uh, well, we didn't have that tournament this year here on, on on Detroit because COVID and our our famous governor wouldn't wouldn't let any tournaments go on. But we could have BFLs, right? BFLs were okay, but a national circuit, you know, that was bad because too forget many about it. Yeah, forget about <laughs> it. So. so Whitmer's probably just as good as Cuomo. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they probably they probably drink coffee together at Starbucks. <laughs> We're definitely not drinking beer. Yeah. No. But they, didn't Whitmer get in trouble for like drinking in a closed bar, like beer at a bar, I feel like I heard something. Yeah, something news. about that. And then she actually had her her husband went to the marina and demanded that they put his boat their boat in before anyone else or something. And yeah, like, no. Of hey, course. So uh yeah, so it, in, oh, fun. we're talking about 2018 when when Grigsby won that tournament. I, I want to take a step back. So I fished the tour from uh, 2003, I think, to 2009. And what I realized in those years is that I never made the Forestwood Cup because I just had too much going on. I was building a business. I had a son, and I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And I, I knew that I, I had I could compete but I couldn't give it a hundred percent. And then, so I stopped, I stopped fishing the tour. I still fished the BFLs here in Michigan. I have a lot of success here in Michigan in, in the BFLs. I fished the, the Costa series, the Everstar to Costa, now the Toyota series and uh, had a lot of success. And I think in 16, I won that tournament out of St. Lawrence, uh, which was epic, incredible event. Uh, and then I sat down at the end of 17 and, my son, who was when I stopped fishing, I wanted to be home for my son too, because I wanted to be there. I wanted to be the Cub Scout den leader. I wanted to coach baseball. I wanted to watch him go walk. I wanted to take him fishing. He was like, dude, are you ever going to fish the tour again? I'm like, well, you think I should? He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, 
you've got a lot. You go, you cool with that? He's like, dude, don't worry about me. Go do it up. So <laughs> I'm like, all right. So in 18, I went back and that's my, that was my first year back fishing the uh, FLW tour. And that was the last year they had co-anglers. Mm. And that my return, I, I think I finished 15th or 16th in the points and I won, won some decent money. And uh, after the Lake St. Clair event, uh, where I came in fourth, we had about a month and a half off. I think that we went to Lake Wachita for the cup. I qualified for the cup, which was great. And I, I went out on Lake St. Clair um, one evening and I, I took uh, my girlfriend out and uh, she wanted to go catch some fish and I was idling in to the ramp to put the boat on the trailer. I'm like, something doesn't feel right. And I feel like my legs feel weird. I got burning and down in my, in my groin area. She's like, oh, maybe pull. I'm like, I don't know. So she got off the dock and, and I tied up the boat to get the truck. When I put the, got out of under the dock, my legs are giving out. I'm like, I must've pulled a nerve or something. So I put the boat on the trailer, pulled it out and I was trying to hitch up the, the straps and whatnot. And I was about falling over. And to make a long story short, she wanted me to go to the hospital. I'm like, I'm not going to the hospital. Let's go eat. I got a tournament tomorrow. There's a big tournament on Lake St. Clair. There's a BFL. I got to go to Buffalo. I had to go to Buffalo for the that event they had there. The Costa, I think called, yeah. Yeah, the day-long tournament. <laughs> yeah, because it so, blew like 40 those last yeah. few days. Yeah. So I uh, – we were at dinner on Lake, by Lake St. Clair, and uh, I had dropped off my truck and boat at my buddy's house because I was going to fish the next day. And I tried to go to the bathroom, and I couldn't go to the bathroom. And I was, well, I walked back to the table. I was like a drunken sailor. I was falling into the tables and stuff. She's like, I'm taking the hospital. So I'm like, all right, I'll go. Let me finish my beer. So I finished my <laughs> beer, got my dinner, and she, she drove me to the hospital. And by the time I got to the hospital, I was like wetting myself. I had no control of anything. Uh, and I had a, ended up having a stroke oh, on, my, on my spinal cord artery on my lower back. So you're, you're, you have a big artery that runs down your spinal cord. And I had a blockage on my lower back in that artery. Jeez. They didn't know what it was. They thought I had a, like spinal cord nearing, like I, I hurt my spine. And I'm like, that might make sense because I was, you know, in some rough water and yada, 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 because I fished for like ever for like weeks before that on St. Clair. And it gets rough on St. Clair. Uh, we call it the Triangle of Tears. There's like an area of Lake St. Clair that has all this boat traffic and it just gets really bouncy. But like, oh, we got to do emergency back surgery. I'm like, I don't know about that. So they did all these MRIs and CAT scans and this and that. And I spent 10 days in the hospital. Oof. And they, I had a stroke on my spinal cord artery, which doesn't happen. It's like 1% of strokes are on your uh, spinal cord artery. And it literally wiped out my whole midsection of my body and my whole left leg. Jeez. Uh, I couldn't pee. I couldn't go number two. And when I left the hospital, I left the hospital with a catheter. And uh, they're like, no, you can't go to that tournament in August. And I'm like, well, I'm going to that tournament in August. I'm sorry. I can walk. I'm getting some mobility back. And I went down there and it was a disaster. I mean, I couldn't, couldn't stand up on the front deck. Uh, like a little, the littlest wave that would hit the side of the boat would almost knock me out of the boat. So I was like, you know, basically hugging the butt seat the whole time. And I, I thought I was done fishing. Uh, I thought it was over. And um, as I got out of that tournament, I came back and I'm like, there was a, a, or a Coastal Series back on St. Lawrence in September. And I said, I'm going to go fish that tournament. I got to go. And I went and fished it. And I think I came in 12th. And but it was another disaster. I could barely stand. I said, I, I, I can't, I can't fish the tour next year. So I sat out. Um, I sat out 2019 just to let my body heal. And I did a lot of therapy and I was doing all this this training. And actually, what worked the best uh, was yoga. I did yoga to work on my balance and and whatnot. And I did yoga like four or five times a week. I was doing P90X to get my core back strengthened. And then I went back in this year, 2020, and um, had my best year ever. I, I finished seventh in the points on the Tackle Warehouse Pro Circuit. And uh, I got a, a victory on 
uh, the Toyota series on the Detroit River, and it's, it's like I'm just like freaking blessed that I can I can run, I can I can dance on the, on the on the deck of the boat now. I'm not like falling in. I still have a little bit of some nerve damage in my left side of my left leg that every once in a while tweaks out a little bit, but about as good as I can get. And and there's a lot of other people that fish or that have more issues than I did. And I'm not saying they're trying to sob story, but it, when you go from 100 percent and you get like knocked in the gut like that where you can't do anything uh it's a it, it was a a very awakening moment for me and uh i remember my my kid was like shit is my dad gonna die when i was in the hospital he's like looking at me he's like oh my god i'm like oh i'm fine we'll go fishing again so <laughs> so yeah that's uh that's the nutshell of, of my journey here we are right now that's awesome. awesome dude. That's a crazy story, but I mean, yeah, first, I'm glad you're okay. Like, geez, <laughs> yeah, glad you're still able to drink beer. <laughs> the funny thing <laughs> was, is all my buddies. I told them the story a thousand times, and my close, close friends all know. But still, a lot of people are like, oh, you, you, you killed your back from driving in those big waves. You drive your boat tour. I'm like, that's not what happened. I had a freaking stroke on my <laughs> spinal cord artery. That's what happened. Nothing's wrong with my back. My back doesn't hurt. My back never hurt. My nothing was <laughs> One ever in wrong a million. with my back. Uh-huh. Yeah. One in a million. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, I think the highlight of the year this year, um, looking back at at all the challenges we had with COVID, well, there was, there was two highlights for me. One was coming back from uh, Lake Martin, you know, nothing to do. We were completely shut down from from work. Uh, my son was off school like indefinitely. So we hooked up that Ranger 520. We drove it over to St. Clair every single day. We were like jacking awesome. huge smallies. You know, we're crawling swim baits on the bottom in like 43 degree water. We're throwing silver buddies. We're catching them on jerk baits. I mean, for And the ice was up <laughs> early this year too. So that was even Ice better. was off early and we were clubbing biggins like. 25, 28 pound days, just about every time we went out there. If we had a 23 pound day, we're like, whoa, what did we do wrong? Like, we suck. We suck. <laughs> and then Whitmer, Whitmer goes, you're not fishing anymore. You can go out <laughs> in a kayak and a sailboat and this and that. So I remember we snuck out to a little inland lake here, Lake Orion, a largemouth lake, and uh, everyone was yelling at us. Uh, you're not supposed to be out there. I'm like, run the trolling motor. We're not using the big motor. Oh, no. <laughs> That doesn't count, you know. And then my buddy was a was a Oakland County Sheriff, and he called me. He's like, someone called in that there was a boat out on Lake Orion, and uh, he's like, they went through there. They went through the lot because he told me they they did a pass through. Well, they didn't see us, so nothing happened. But you no, know, it, it was serious. You couldn't fish, and all the lakes were empty for like two and a half weeks. Uh, so we started doing, uh, we called it the chatter bait challenge. So we would, we would renegade all the golf courses back. Like when I was growing up, uh, we would just sneak onto courses and we'd have the chatter bait challenge. So we would both take a, take a chatter bait and we'd take the passenger out and we, we'd go out and we'd go out on the golf course. Cause no one was golfing either, mind you. Yeah. So the golf oh, course perfect time, perfect timing. Right. So we would get out there. Some days we wouldn't get kicked off. But typically, we got kicked off. The guy would come around and get out of it. We had a lot of fun doing that. And uh, just being able to spend a lot of time with him and, and to teach him skills, like where I could actually focus on that, was, was an awesome feeling. And then uh, the other highlight was fishing the uh, the title championship this year on uh, was supposed to be the St. Lawrence River. That really bummed me out. Como? Mm. Oh, ah, I'm punch that guy. <laughs> Because we, oh, we, we, we were supposed to go to Champlain, and I was supposed to go to St. Lawrence River twice. And I love I loved the St. Lawrence River almost more than I love Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River. I love oh, that place. Wow. I it's just, the holy land up there. It is. Oh, it's the Holy Grail. It's so, so beautiful. And so we didn't get to go there, unfortunately, for the title championship, which was the catchway release, like the MLF format. We went to uh, Sturgeon Bay. Which was fine. I wasn't complaining. Uh, and it was an awesome experience. I, I enjoyed it. I didn't do great. I mean, I, I think 14th or whatever, it doesn't, you really don't place in that thing unless you win. 
you know, because the way they do the brackets. But I didn't, I didn't make the knockout round, uh, and I really thought I would. But just the whole experience of going through that event and and having, uh, I had a camera in my boat a couple of days too, which was great. And I had my Trump flags flying on the back of my power poles. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but uh, yeah, that was that was that was that was awesome. That was an awesome experience, and that's something that. You know, if I have another good year next year on the tour that I could qualify for the BBT and, uh, you know, it's going to be the top 10 anglers in the points for a two year span. So the 2020 season and the 2021, they're going to take 10 anglers from the Tacawaros Pro Circuit to go fish the Bass Pro Tour. And I'm all about it because it's freaking awesome experience. You don't know. I mean, I, I, everyone, they say that you think they, they're all told to say that when they're on the show, but it is truly, it is truly an experience. Nerve wracking. It's yeah. an entirely different way of fishing too. Yeah. Crazy. Cause you know, everything that's going on. It's like, Oh my God, Dobson, you have 18 and a half pounds and you're on day three on the Toyota series. And you're like, you're still grinding because you want to catch more because you don't know if you won or not. But in that event, if you like had a pretty decent lead, you're going to like, you know what? I'm going to slide off here and I'm going to go practice over here. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go check this area out over here. I'm going to do this and that. And that's what having that the score tracker gives you ability to do is to really know what's going on, what the other guy's doing. Like Casey Scallon and I were fishing pretty close together. He was just zigging the right way. And now it's zag. And he'd go and catch seven or eight over there. And I catch like one or two. And he'd go catch four or five and I catch like two. So, but seeing what he was doing and what other people were doing, you could see other people on, on the lake if they're, I mean, it was a big body of water, but great experience. Awesome. And yeah, they put on a good show that the major league officials are, are class acts and uh, great, great, awesome, awesome experience. And I mean, there's a lot of haters that don't like that catchaway release. Um, but a lot of people that I talk to that aren't avid tournament bass men love that concept. They really like it. So well, it's exciting. Yeah. So that's my story. That's awesome, dude. Well, I'm curious though, within that timeline, when did you kind of, I guess not discover smallmouth, but really kind of build that passion for the Detroit river, the St. Clair and actually targeting specifically just smallmouth. The first time that Kevin and I, we were in college, that would have been probably 93 or 94. We took his uh, aluminum boat from East Lansing, which is in the middle of the state, uh, Michigan State University. We drove all the way over Lake St. Clair. That was like an hour and 40 minute drive. That was a big deal for college kids because that required gas money. Yeah. Uh, and we went over to Muskimoo Bay and we hit like, we hit it perfect. It was just a light chop sun was high the water was super clear and we smashed the sight fish off the beds you know we were catching four pounders four and a half five pounders and i'm like i love sight fishing and i had a pretty good knack for sight fishing and i've really probably caught more smallmouth looking at them and not not necessarily spawning but looking at them catching whether it's at it's pre-spawn spawn or post spawn all the way through the summer and into the fall like i love the sight fish smallmouth i mean that is my deal and that started back then and it's you know i'm a, a jerk bait fanatic as well i love jerk bait and smallmouth um that's probably number two but my ultimate passion in in early early well late winter and fall is blade bait fishing with the with the silver buddy that's i mean those are like my three things so that's what I, I mean. I love catching smallmouth, and I just I don't even hunt in the fall because that's my opportunity to go out and focus on, on big smallmouth. And I can uh, be friends with you guys because I don't hunt either. So I am a bass fisherman all the way till the lake freezes. Well, come on, and then up. I go steelhead fishing. Yeah, so <laughs> you know we yeah, St. Clair has a ton of fish, but it doesn't have a ton of big big fish. It doesn't have like the six pounders and six and a half and sevens like you have on Lake Ontario. Uh, but the 30 pound goal was always like the Holy grail here in, in Lake St. Clair, like who's going to break 30 pounds and um, years and years. Like, this is, I don't even know when it was. I found a, I found some fish and they ended up being in that area for, for years to come. 
and we went out there. We caught 2968. This oh. is like 10 or 12 years ago, just a smidge, and I caught them all at a blade bait. But my team partner, he could not get that that little subtle vibration down and feel him that just little erratic. Jerker. Yeah, he was. He, they, they, with, the, with the blade bait, you, it's it's less is best. You don't really want to hop it a lot, but you want to get it to rip a few times. And when it falls down, they they either hit it as it falls, or they'll hit it right when it hits the bottom. But you don't always feel the bite until you lift up. So it's kind of like it's kind of like punching, right? It's kind of like punching a weight through a mat. And you go down and you might feel a load up, but you don't want to like set the hook because you'll miss them every time. You just kind of want to keep them like real into them. So it's like a high yeah. speed reel, just real kind of like a yeah, drop real shot. Into one pull, kind of set the hook at the same time. But if you drop the rod tip, set the hook, you'll you'll miss them 90% of the time on the blade bait. So like, I'm gonna learn how to fish that blade bait. And then it took us probably, and we had 28 pounds, 27 pounds, 28 pounds, and I think four or five years ago, we broke 30 pounds on Lake St. Clair. We had 30.31, and it was like, that was an awesome achievement. But um, smallmouth fishing and, and anything in the Great Lakes is is my 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 deal. That's what gets me going in the morning. That's awesome. I'm curious then with, uh, obviously, you've put in a lot of time with the blade bait. You know, what, what kind of rod specs do you look for for throwing a blade bait? I'm just curious. So on the blade bait, um, Obviously, I, I'm throwing it on a bait caster. A lot of guys like to throw it on a spinning spinning rod. I don't know why. I just cannot wrap my head around that. I don't think you have enough power. But I throw a, a Dobbin 704 CB, which is a seven foot. It's a four power crankbait rod. It's a, a rod that you would use for pop bars or jerk baits. Uh, so Dobbins has a line of rods that are a crankbait rod. So any rod, I guess, out there that has a little bit more parabolic action, like it's more giving, bend all the way through. So I would I would say like a jerk bait rod or like a pop bar rod is what you want to use. Seven foot being the ideal length, seven five to one or an eight eight to one uh, retrieve and twelve or fourteen pound test fluorocarbon, and do not put a snap on it, but a. Uh, Oh, not O-ring, but a split ring. Split ring, yeah. Put a split ring on it instead of a snap. Uh, and uh, I use I use the Silver Buddy, the original Silver Buddy that uh, Buddy Banks makes down there in uh, in Kentucky. And I love the stainless steel one, not the nickel plated one. It chips off. You want the flash, and flash is what you want in the clear water. You want some flash. The water gets a little bit dingier. And you can throw the gold one. And, uh, and, you know, talking about the, the muddy water that you're going to face, um, the blade bait is, is, you know, if that water temperature is below 60, that's when I start throwing that, that blade bait. I mean, you can catch fish like 64, 65, probably, I think mm -hmm. is the water temp. So it's good. It's going to be, it's going to be tricky. So it's going to be tricky. So <laughs> you know, it might be a, a, a kai talk, uh, on the bottom, you know, but, uh, but the blade bait is when the water gets below 60 degrees, it's all it's all blade bait, tube, and swim bait for me. And a rig, of course. But mm -hmm. does anyone throw an a rig for smallmouth? Oh yeah. No. 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 <laughs> yeah, we do. I didn't catch on to that one right away. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I asked that rod spec stuff. This is something that Andy and I were debating the other day because. Uh, I use a spinning, and I've I haven't I'm not well versed with a blade bait just yet, and I have experience with it, but not uh, to a, an extent, you know. Like obviously, like yourself, so that's why I ask. Because Andy told me the other day that he uses a back, uh, bait caster, and I'm like, really? A seven oh like, four crankbait rod. Yeah. <laughs> so, or yeah, a seven two four. You don't want a, a super stiff rod, and and I I just kind of. So I don't know what made me throw that that uh, jerk bait rod that I throw, but once I started throwing it on that, my my hookup ratio and my landing ratio has been greatly improved. Um, and I don't do the I don't do the braid uh, for the hooks. Like I know Seth Fire talks about tying the braid instead of using a, a, sp a split ring. I put split rings on on my for my hooks, and I put a split ring at the line tie and. Um, 
I like short shank trebles. Um, I like those magic eye trebles. Uh, what I like about those are when it's cold out and your fingers don't work when it's when it's cold, obviously, is that it's easy to change out the, the treble hooks on those things so you got that smushed eye so you can mm. put it back on, on the split ring pretty easy. But that's awesome. I mean, you know, talking about, you know, we're coming into October right now. It's opening day of deer season here in Michigan, and you don't see me saying I got to get off the computer because I got to go sleep to go bow hunt because I'm not going to go bow hunt. I'm going to go fast fishing. I'm going to I'm going to pull out. I'm going to have probably four things on my deck. I'm going to have a, an A rig, and I'm going to have a deep dive jerk bait, and I'm going to have a tube. I'm going to have five things: a tube, I'm going to have a swim bait, single swim bait, and a uh, tube. That's all you need. You don't throw an old drop shot. We're going to have two tubes. Did I say two twice? Yes, swim bait, swim bait, tube, deep diving jerk bait, silver body, rig, and an A rig. It's fine. Yeah. This, there we go. Who, nice. Who's counting? <laughs> well, How no, you didn't say the silver body the first time. You said tube twice. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to have two tubes on my deck. You can blame a few things. <laughs> I'll have a, a green pumpkin tube, and then I also, in the fall, I always put a uh, a smoke tube on the deck or a smoke purple. They seem, you know, they seem to get on bait that time of the year, um, yeah. and it, it's it, it's just a, a deal we do up here, and I'm I'm sure you do it in Buffalo or Lake Ontario, but we have so the A rig is, uh, you know, a lot of people throw it for smallmouth, but I don't think a lot of people really understand what it what it takes to catch smallmouth on an A rig. It's uh, it's not just throw it out there and wind it in. I mean, it's all about the mm -hmm. countdown. It's all about how much weight you put on it. It's all about what color swimmers you have on there. You know, running dummies. Like if if it's a tournament where you can use five hooks, I don't like throwing five hooks. I don't want to catch five fish at once. I want to catch one. I don't want if it's one, it's gonna be the biggest one usually. It's gonna be the biggest one, and you can go back there because you get two or three smallmouth on on a neighbor. It's it's a disaster. It's an epic fail. Like my son did. They're going son this Iver. way. <laughs> yeah, he he slung out the a rig last year. He's like, oh, I got a muskie. I'm like, really? But what he what he did is he, he was just winding. He was just winding it in, and he wasn't like reefing on it. So one. Locked on, another one locked on, another one locked on. By the time we got to the boat, I looked down and it was like a blob of smallmouth like this. <laughs> <laughs> and they were, like, they were all four and a half and like five pounders. Kid you not. That's and awesome. he, only, he only landed two of them. His arms broke and hooked straightened on another one. And he came up with two. And that whole school, you know, all those fish, you know, they, they took off and, and they split. So I only run three hooks and I, I run two hitchhikers up top. And those are always the ones that are going to be the highest on the air because there's no weight on them. I think that's important because you don't want weight in your BFL or your Toyota. If it's a three hook, you know, maximum, you want hitchhikers up top. You don't want weight up there because you don't want that A rig to come down and you got your dummies on the bottom with no hooks because they're going to eat that and you're not going to hook up on the fish. And, yeah. That's, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time fishing the A-Rig in, in the fall. You know, they don't bite it so much in the spring up here. I don't know. I don't know why that is, but it's it's definitely a fall thing. And in that Toyota series, uh, two weeks ago, I caught a large majority of my fish on, on the A-Rig. Hmm. Uh, and, and that, I throw that on, a, on an eight-foot um, Dobbins 806 CB. That's an eight foot six power crankbait rod. That's like a crankbait rod that's meant for 10 XDs. Mm. And it's the same, same concept. It's like a big parabolic rod and you cast it out there and it, it loads up and it bombs out there and the fish eats it. It you know folds and it's not super stiff. Uh and I don't I don't I don't lose fish on it. Just don't. I started out yeah, throwing like an eight foot flipping rod. That was like <laughs> It's like you got tendonitis, right? Yeah. And when you set the <laughs> hook into it, you're like breaking arms off. Yeah, you got to let, let, yeah, let, let the rod do the work. Let the rod go out. So, 
I'm going to be throwing an A-Rig on Saturday. I can guarantee you that. I'm probably going to have one on, even though it's going to be muddy. So just throw some chartreuse well, swimmers on. The more you spin, the more you win. Make sure you got blades on. Always. That's my motto. Even in clear water. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say, hey, the more you spin, the more you win. So if you got blades on your spinner, uh, you'll uh, you'll catch more fish. Um, in the muddy water, now there's there's some A-rigs out there that have uh, bigger blades, too. Yeah, actually, um, the one I'm I'm going to run has slightly bigger blades on it. So, so I'm going to run. The brown dog tack ones, they definitely have bigger blades. <laughs> you can actually customize them, the ones that Ian makes, Bailey. They come with size three or three and a half. So I got the one with three and a halfs. Nice. Willow blades. They come through real nice. So I always, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make a chartreuse and white A-rig. So paints of blades, some blades chartreuse, some white. And they probably and they crush it. <laughs> get some chartreuse, like uh, Kytex with some white Kytex, you know? Mm -hmm. And it just might be a big ball of chartreuse and white. <laughs> have, you, I mean, have you thrown that? I have not. I'm not going to go and paint. So that blades. company I was just talking about, he actually made chartreuse. A rigs with chartreuse blades. Who makes them? Uh, Ian Renfrew, Brown Dog Tackle Company out of Syracuse. Well, I might have to call that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he makes them. In, uh, he makes them also in like clear smallmouth magic. I have a, I have a couple smallmouth magic ones, and they're nice. Hmm. I throw the uh, I throw the Shane's Bates A rig primarily. Mm -hmm. And what I like about that, I don't, I don't know if it's the best A rig out there. It's just what I'm, what I'm used to throwing. And uh, I like it because if an arm breaks, I can unscrew that head and I can put another set of arms on, and I'm hmm. back on. Hmm. So the That's the good. arms are, yeah, the arms are interchangeable. The other A rig I throw is the uh, the strike. That's King. Shane LeHue, right? Mm -hmm. Shane yeah, LeHue sure. out of yep. yeah, because what he used to fish Norman a lot, and I think he won a few tournaments down there on Norman. Throwing the yep, A-Rig or Hartwell or one of the two. Yeah. yeah. My my buddy Billy fished college against him down there. He knows he that's the only A rig he throws is Shane's A rig. It's got like a titanium screw head on it, right? Yep. That you can mm -hmm. pull apart and put a new arm in. Yeah. And the other one that's pretty good that has bigger blades and puts off a lot of vibration. And it also takes longer for it to fall down. It's that Strike King uh titanium one. Mm-hmm. It's got big old honking blades on it. It's a thumper. I mean, it mm. puts out some. Puts and out it some pulsates blood. real nice too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's pretty durable. So, yeah. But the tube, you can never go wrong throwing the damn tube in the fall. Yeah. And no one throws it anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even throw it. I I, I hate tube fishing, but that's because you, you throw a Ned rig. Um, not even really. I just I'm a drop shotter. You can't almost you all my money I've won on smallmouth fishing has been out of drop shot. You don't drop shot in the fall. It's no, no. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, once the water gets to a certain degree, I put it away and then I drag a swim bait or throw a swim bait. But when I'm fishing deep, but it has like there's a certain temperature threshold for me to put it down. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, the, there's no doubt that the drop shot works and. The drop shot drives me nuts. It's a tangled freaking mess of mess. There's only so one thing worse is netting a fish with an A rig. That's the only thing worse. You know? <laughs> Don't flip every fish on an A rig just because if you net them, every hook gets stuck in a yeah. part of the oh. net and then the fish is thrashing and an arm breaks. It's like, forget this. <laughs> so I started dipping my net. This is not a sponsor plug, but I do. I think I'm going to try to get a sponsor from Flex Seal. I take my net, I put cardboard down, I take the liquid Flex Seal, I pour it on the cardboard, put on a pair of gloves. Uh, Just rub it all in. I rub it all over my net, and I hang it. I, like, spread it out. You know, so it's, like, a net, and I, I just hang it over, and I let it drip dry, and it's the ultimate snag-proof net. It's incredible. Interesting. Yeah. There you go. There's your plug. 
tip of the day. That's a good plug. Yeah. That's that's a good we're going to see Scott running in a. No, uh, it doesn't have to be flex seal. It can be any liquid, liquid rubber out there. Just don't like try a, to use, don't use undercoating. That it doesn't dry. It's got to be it. liquid rubber. But uh, so you've but tried yeah. undercoating. Yeah. If work. you're on St. Clair, St. Clair next season, you see a flex seal uh, ranger Brown. around. Think yeah. it's probably Scott. <laughs> that's, that's too cool. Oh, man. Oh, Scott, the tube, I, the, tube the tube. Don't forget about the tube. Rattles or no tube. rattles? Huh? Rattles no or rattles. no rattles? No, no rattles. Oh, if, man. If you're hmm. cracking the tube, if you're cracking a tube, rattle. If you're fishing a tube in the fall, it's slow, slow. Shake on slack line, give it a little crack. Wait, wow. I'll rip the rod in man. <laughs> Andy, that, that day that you and I went out on Erie and I met you on the kayak, that, that's all I threw all day was a tube. I don't you know. caught him. Yeah. What's that? And you probably yeah. caught him too. I he caught did. him pretty I kind of, I have it. It was a weird way I was throwing the tube that day. I was throwing it on 17 pound, and it was an EWG tube hook from Venom because I didn't buy the uh, the bite me ones yet. And I was just using it like a football jig as I was, I was drifting with the tube and then felt the bite and was hitting them like a football jig. And that was the only way I could get them. It's kind of oh, interesting. Yeah. I was kind of experimenting with it, but it worked okay. But I'm kind of curious with, with your smallmouth fishing, you know, Detroit River, uh, St. Clair side, put that – like out the door, where is your comfort? Do you have a comfort zone outside of smallmouth up north? Like, is there anything else where you can go down maybe, you know, southeast or like a Chickamauga, like a TVA where you feel comfortable? Uh, spotted bass legs. Interesting. Like blueback herring legs or? Yeah. Yeah. Chickamauga was never been to Chickamauga. And after going through that event, and I was trying, that that was dis, that was a disaster. Big Amaya was like, you, oh god, oh. <laughs> We're not I'm, like, about it. <laughs> I'm not fishing in a damn crowd. Like, yeah. I'm not gonna do it. And and I realized quickly that if I didn't get into a crowd, because every time I go into a place, I go, I was gonna die. But fishing Chickamauga, uh, Kentucky Lake. Any of those TVA lakes that have current, I, I've had some pretty good success, and it, it's got a lot better over the years because I can really fish them like I do back home, like fishing Detroit River, St. Clair River, or the St. Lawrence River. So a lot of the, the smallmouth stuff you can put to a largemouth current and spotted bass current. But the other place that I really loved that I've uh, – it was kind of like Feast for Famine was Okeechobee. I like that place. It's really a natural lake. It's got natural grass. It changes every year. You can find little nuances and you can catch fish. Uh, and I really started loving punching. That's <laughs> I love punching. I don't do it a lot. We can do it here, but I don't fish the inland lakes here, but I love punching. Freaking love it. <laughs> love it. With it like it I got so jacked. It's just oh. That's what, that's what I like to do. So your comfort zone outside of smallmouth is the almost polar opposite of what you're comfortable with. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, like, it, the more you fish, and, like, to me, it's like I'm at that point where I sucked it up a lot, and I got to a point where your, your age and your wisdom and your skill, you get to a point where they all come together, where – you make smart decisions, but you and you can fish well, and you have a lot of ex experience, and you still have stamina. And you get like to this this apex here. You know, it doesn't mean you're going to fall off on the other side of it. It might it might flatten out. I don't know. I, I feel like I got to that point where I can make smart decisions. I still have stamina. You know, I can still get up in the morning. I can still fish all day, and that's like an important thing. Like a lot of the younger guys. So you'd say you're riding like a plateau on the apex. Maybe. I don't know. It's only been two years. So it was, you know, it was 2018. I took 19 off off the tour, but this year was good. I got next year to contend with. So I, I think you get to a point where all that all comes together. 
and I don't know how long that's going to last. I hope it lasts as long as it can, uh, you know, being healthy and staying in shape. And, you know, you got to, you got to stay healthy. I'm 47 and uh, I'm pretty, pretty active. And you see a lot of people that they don't stay active and you can get cannibalized by the competition because the young guys, I mean, they're freaking machines, man. They're like, Freaking Tasmanian up and down. Down. on the water at six, idling by six thirty. Yeah, off the water at eight thirty. Eat dinner, go to sleep, and edit it in the next. Day. Yeah, they eat like McDonald's and macaroni and cheese and peanut butter and jellies all day, and they get up and do it again. And like Dakota <laughs> Abra, he stayed at my house for a week, and I'm like, "Come home, like freak, get off the lake. You don't need to be out there." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So yeah, so I uh, yeah, punching and any you know anything with with current uh, down down and like TVA lakes becoming more and more a passion of mine and and I love fishing for spotted bass. That's awesome. That is one I have yet to cross off the list. Have you caught a spot before, Andy? I haven't fished south of like Erie, PA for bass. I've been all New York. So. What? Yeah, yeah. I just. I, I just I, I haven't had the opportunity to really travel for it yet, and I'm hoping that changes in the next couple of years. I'm. What do you I'm Uber everywhere? Do you Uber your boat to the lake? Heck yeah, man! <laughs> Call them with my beer. They pick it up, take me down. You know. <laughs> oh, I just <laughs> I um I didn't really get like heavy into tournament fishing till like oh let's say five years ago. And then I had a rinky-dink javelin for a couple of years that I won some money. And then uh, last year, I'm blessed with a beautiful daughter. And I sold my boat midsummer with the idea of I was going to buy a, a newer, better boat this spring, which I did. And now I'm in the process of upgrading said boat. So next summer, I do plan on traveling a little bit more. There you go. So well, next summer is going to be the year. Yeah. <laughs> come up to Michigan. You come now, come next week, come all the way through November. It gets better and better into November, but it gets colder and colder. It's oh, I don't mind the better. cold. <laughs> Your fingers Let's... might mind it when you can't when you can't actually land the fish and put them back into the water. You you, you there's a point of like diminishing returns, like but yeah, it can, it so, can be uh, pretty epic. A little backstory here on me: I worked at a car wash for couple of years when I was younger and I didn't wear gloves in the winter time because I couldn't feel anything. So I also still had fish all winter long and Lord behold, it'll be five degrees out and I don't wear gloves because I'm an idiot. So <laughs> when it's 30 degrees out and I'm bass fishing, not wearing gloves does not bother me. I can feel my hands all day long. So that part is not bothering get numb. They get cold. So they'll get cold, they'll get numb, and then once they're numb, I'm good. Because then I'm like, oh, is holding a five pounder or a six pounder <laughs> you can't can't close your hand on them. <laughs> and your thumbs don't work. You're like, and you're like dropping the fish. You're like, yeah. yeah I that's where you just grab them by the belly because then they just sit in your hand. Yeah. But the picture and at that point, they're so cold, they like fold in half, kind of like a taco because they, they get yeah. like that cold water curl to them. Mm -hmm. they're, yeah. they're funny when they're cold. <laughs> but you fold have... them up. There, and the tail folds up. Yeah, yeah. Tail, just, yeah, tail folds move. up. You're trying to push it down, like, <laughs> and then you turn them around, put them in the other hand. The tail will flow up the other side. It's like, what are you doing? Oh, <laughs> That's too funny. So, so yeah, last winter we got out three days after Christmas on Erie and had like a hundred fish day. Yeah, that's hey, hundred fish days now. Like in the old days, that that was common, and yeah, uh, no, it's, it's hard now. Yeah, it's hard now with everyone that's out there, and there's a lot. Hey, COVID time, it's. I mean, our lakes have been destroyed. I mean, I wouldn't say destroyed. It feels like they got a lot of pressure, and the fish seem to not bite as frequent. You don't get as many bites, and especially here on the Great Lakes, we're restricted to U.S. waters only. We can't go yeah, to Canada, yeah. which is three quarters of Lake Saint Clair is Canada, like the Holy Grail, all the good water um, is is Canada. Although I'm that's what we issue. think, but I mean, we're still getting big bags in, in, in Michigan waters of Lake St. Clair and Michigan waters of the Detroit River end of Lake Erie. I mean, the, I don't think the weights are that, that far off. Uh, so it's, uh, 
I guess when you get restricted to fishing in certain water, you got to figure out how to catch a big fish. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's no different for you guys on, on Buffalo and whatnot. Oh, because my I am 100% a Canadian water fisherman in the summer. And this summer it killed me. It was my worst summer I ever had fishing derbies on Erie because I would hop in my buddy Jeff's boat and go out and both of us fish Canada. So like, what do we do? <laughs> like we're out there. Yeah, we're like, oh, I gotta go practice again. <laughs> it's it, like that was, that was because, Yeah, <laughs> it, you have to go out and you gotta. I I had to practice. Like my brain's out this year. I I spent countless hours, days. I spent like two weeks graphing the U.S. waters of Lake Erie. It was so boring. Oh, God. oh, and, and the U.S. waters of Lake Erie is terrible compared to like Healy and. The entire mm -hmm. area is Chester, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was it was hard. Like, I mean, days. Like, not even catching like catching drum, but not catching bass. So, yeah, it was a it was an interesting year. I'm looking forward to 2020 getting the hell out of here, and I'm looking forward to life getting back to normal. I'm looking forward to going into a bar, not having to wear a stupid mask when I go into the place, and I'm looking <laughs> to go into a baseball game. I want to go to a concert. You know, I want Whitmore to. I don't know, something's not happening. You know, I just <laughs> want life to get back to normal. I want to go fish a tournament, and I don't want to have to wear a stupid buff, which does absolutely nothing for COVID, by the way. It's such no. a joke. <laughs> so that's, what, that's the only thing I want. I'm not asking for much. Yeah. No, just, just life back, right? Just life yeah. back. There's nothing wrong with it before we get into it. But uh, Andy, you got anything else for Scott before we ask him our uh, our last question here? Oh uh -oh. no, I'm pretty. I think we covered uh, what oh. I wanted to know. So yeah, that's the last question. It's a good one. <laughs> so the last questions are our fun question. We like to ask everybody who's new to the show. Um, it's it's fun because it kind of puts you on the spot because we don't we don't tell you about it prior. Um, I can already see the wheels turning. Um, so our question for you is. If you could sit down, have a steak and a beer with any three people to pick their brain, who would that be and why? They, they don't have to be the fishing industry. They can be, you know, 400 years ago or they could be current. Who would you invite to have a steak, a beer, and pick their brain? Elon Musk. Okay. I like it. Uh, the cat from uh, Amazon. Um, like Jeff Bezos. Uh, Jeff Bezos. And... I mean, I've, I've talked to Van Dam a lot, so I, I probably don't want to talk to him. But Rick Klon, because he's just Rick Klon has got so much knowledge and has been around for so long, and he's so like weathered and freaking like the epitome of like a an old saltwater <laughs> fisherman. Yeah, and he's so out there. So it would be him, Elon Musk, because he's like a he's like a savage. He's like a, a Front runner, he's all things crazy and innovative, and Jeff Bezos because he took something that was stupid and made it into like the richest man in the world, essentially. Uh, yeah. Sending books in the mail, um, <laughs> and I, I'm a I'm a business guy, and, and I like to make money with the, everyone else. But what I'm really looking forward to, like, is if I had all those guys on, I'd sit down with them, and and, and I think I already know what I need to do, but I really want to like catapult my fishing career so i feel like my business is dying and i wanted like this year i almost it felt like i almost had an opportunity to give 110 percent fishing i didn't have a lot of distractions and it felt good to be able to fish and not have to worry about other distractions uh, but you know i mean i i got a lot of things i need to improve on i gotta I, I need to work on my social media game it hasn't been a priority to me i love to fish i love competition i love to compete against the fish and the fishermen and win money, but in all re reality, uh, you can't make a living doing that. I mean, you probably could, but not the kind of living that I would want to make that I'm used to, you know, living. So that's what I need to do, and that's what I'd like to hear from those guys. And those guys are those guys are awesome. All those guys, Elon Musk. Elon Musk. And I'm I'm waiting for the hydrogen uh, fuel cells to come out for for bass boats, motors, and and, and engines. Oh, they'll probably, you'll probably see like 120 miles an hour out of a 250 horse motor because they're going to have so much combustion and power. 
<laughs> it's coming. It's coming. I, I, it will be, I don't know if it's 10 years from now or 20 years from now, but there will be like hydrogen fuel cells sooner than later. Oh, I'm sure. Wow. It'll probably be all powered by Tesla. The Tesla outboard probably. motor. So we should all buy, you should buy, you should look at the Tesla stock. It's very <laughs> volatile, but uh, I think you can make some money on that. Oh yeah, buy that, buy on the downs and sell on the highs. Mm -hmm. That's, cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Scott, you got anything you like uh, the viewers or listeners to uh, to hear before we uh, end our podcast here tonight? Uh, you know, like this year when when I went back on the tour this year after being off, uh, defendant one has a bass boat out there. Trick step, um, he makes uh, it's a, a wench post a ladder that goes on to your to your winch post. It's a three step with a handlebar to get on, on your front deck of your boat. He's the guy that got me back on the tour this year. He helped me out. He was my title sponsor. He's a great guy. He builds a great product. He's going to be making uh, uh, mounts for the front of your boat, for your graphs and for the council. He's got a lot of cool products. He's, he's the reason why I went back on tour this year. Cause I, I told him, I said, Hey, I can't do it. And he's like, I'm going to take care of him. And you took care of me. And I got back out because I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay it my whole way anymore. I just, I just can't do that. So without him, I wouldn't have been here. And he's been a great support to me, 100%. Awesome. That's awesome. Yes, a huge shout out to him. And Scott, thank you for coming on. We really appreciate you taking the time. And we're definitely no going to him again uh, in the coming future. Appreciate it. Take care, guys. Yeah, have a good yeah night. you too. Go nice slice some smallies. Yeah. <laughs> <Cheers. Perfect. laughs> Hey, dude, that was a uh, that was a blast. We oh, had yeah. a lot of valuable, valuable information there. That was good, especially for anybody who's uh, a smallmouth fisherman or somebody looking to learn more about smallmouth. I mean, that's you got a good chunk of it right there that you can yeah. take into account and learn. It's that was a lot of fun. I think we go tying a blade bait <laughs> for this weekend. Yeah, <laughs> muddy water. Why not? Yeah, I I, I want to play around more with uh, bait caster setups for for blade baits after talking about that. And the only difference like, is I use the other day about rod setups, and yeah. I was I was like, you really use a bait caster? Oh yeah, because I usually use uh, it's like a seven foot two extra fast is what I usually use for bait casters, but hit uh, them in real. Yeah, but uh, that's something I'm gonna experiment with. It should be a uh, should be interesting to play around with that, no doubt. But Good podcast today. Thank you again to Scott for uh, for joining yeah, thanks, us. Scott. Super appreciate it. That was a. Uh, I, I walk. I'm walking away with a lot of new information. So that's. I'm very pleased. I know so are the uh, viewers and listeners. And uh, shout out to all of our sponsors. Thank you guys for the constant support. We will see you guys on the next podcast. So thank you guys again for watching and listening. We'll see you guys next.